Good evening, everyone. My name is Jim Garman. I'm the town historian and the president of the Historical Society. Um, we are using a new venue tonight, which is very special to us because we can get a bigger crowd than we can get in the library, which is really great. Um, and I'm going to be giving a talk on ferries and bridges on the island. Uh, some of you have heard me give a talk on transportation before. This is a new presentation. Uh, I haven't done this one before, and I have too many slides, so I'm going to go through some of them pretty quickly. First, we have to have a commercial. The Portsmouth Historical Society is growing. We had, two years ago, we had 85 memberships. Right now, we have about 530. And we want some more. I got applications right here. You can pick them up after. We'd love to have you join us. We have, and that gets you a newsletter every month, and we have board meetings every month, and we have, this year, we had 17 functions that we did and we have one more uh, coming up and that's very special we're going to have the Navy choristers do a benefit for us at uh, St. Barnabas on December 8th and uh, we'll ha that's going to be a benefit for the Historical Society so it's really special uh, I'm going to move back here when I get going here so don't worry about me standing in front of you all right so what what I'm going to talk about tonight is the bridges and ferries all around the island uh, I'm going to go fairly fast, and I do talk fast sometimes, so bear with me on that. Uh, I will give you time to look at the pictures. I have a remote so I can get out of the way over here. I'm going to stand over here. And again, sometimes my, because of my old age, my voice trails off. So if you can't hear me, just wave, and I'll be able to catch that. All right. We're ready to go? All set. We are videoing this, by the way, and it will be on uh, YouTube. It will probably be on local access TV as well. So uh, just so you know, that's and going on. on. Through our website. Pardon? Through the website. Through our website. That's right. OK. So we have a website, PortsmouthHistorical.org, and there's a ton of stuff on there. So go look at it sometime and get a chance. All right. Bridges and ferries on the island. Here we go. How about that? We've got bridges and ferries. You have the, the one on top left is the uh, Bristol Ferry. It came in not at Bristol Ferry, but it came in right now. It's under the Mount Hope Bridge. If you go over there someday and look, you'll see the pilings that are still there. Uh, but that's where the ferry came in. And that, that's the Bristol. The Bristol was one of the two ferries that was used to go to Bristol. Bear with me. You have to have a pointer. That's the, one, that's the Bristol Ferry there. And uh, it was a glass plate negative. I wish I could sharpen it enough to know what the rates were, but I couldn't. This, you know, is a stone bridge. This is a 1912 stone bridge, the last stone bridge. And of course, this is the beautiful Sakonet River Bridge. When, right at the time it was finished, just as it was finished being built. OK, we do live on an island. Sometimes we forget. But we have to realize that uh, on this island, we weren't always connected to the mainland. In fact, we were barely connected to the mainland from 1795 until 1929. The stone bridge, the first stone bridge, there's lots of them, uh, was built in 1795. The Mount Hope Bridge was built in 1929. Other than that, it was all ferries, get on and off the island. And before 1795, it was all ferries. So, Quidnick Island was purchased in 1638. The town of Portsmouth was settled in 1638, a year before Newport was settled, but it was settled by the same, some of the same people. They got disillusioned with some things that were going on out here in Portsmouth, so they moved to Newport. Actually, the real reason was economics. Uh, it was a better harbor, and potentially a better harbor. Everything to the right of Thames Street and America's Cup Avenue was a swamp back then, but they did bring in a lot of fill. So Roger Williams helped purchase this, and the first settlers came and and, and tied up out here on this part of the, uh, of the town and the island. Okay, I've pretty much gone over all that. The town pond, I think everybody probably knows where the town pond is. It's over by the Roger Williams Conference Center behind that. That's how a lot of, a lot of them came in uh, when the first settlers came here, uh, through the town pond. Some came in through the, the river uh, as well. well. That was called, and I'll show you a slide about this, it was called the Pacasset River way back. 
The settlement in Tiverton, the Indian settlement in Tiverton was called Pocasset. And when they first came to Portsmouth, they called it Pocasset as well. Uh, but then about a year, less than a year later, they changed it to Portsmouth, uh, for Portsmouth, England, where most of them had come from, or at least traveled from. So commercial interest launched Newport as a major port. And Newport was one of the five most important ports in the British North American colonies, along with Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, that's before the Revolutionary War. The maritime interests there were great. It was a, really a major port. If you really stop and think about it, Aquidneck Island might have ended up like Manhattan <coughs> if the British hadn't occupied us for three years, which devastated the economy, the, the whole island. And a lot of people left during that time. So we have ferries. And the ferries, first ones were to Bristol from Portsmouth and to Tiverton from Portsmouth. Uh, we might not realize the fact that until about 1747, I think it was, I'm not sure the exact date, Tiverton was part of Massachusetts. And Tiverton was, Barrington was, Little Compton was, Cumberland was. That was all part of Massachusetts. Anyway, they had ferries that went across from <coughs> here to those towns and also ferries from Newport across Narragansett Bay. The early ferries were rowboats and sailboats. And they even had a horse boat. Between 18, about 1842, 46, they had a two horsepower boat. They walked the treadmill, literally, and, and powered the boat. Later, they got a little smarter and found out they could use steam and uh, oil and so on. These are some of the early ferries. The first one on the top left is the Sagamore. That was owned by the Newport and Providence Street Railway Company. Uh, the Sagamore went, it was a Bristol ferry, but it couldn't take cars. There weren't many cars back in those days. Uh, and then it was replaced or added on to by the Bristol, which is this one. And in this picture, you have the Sagamore and the Bristol together. There were also other ferries in the area. Uh, these two right here are the West Side and the J.A. Saunders. Now, you might wonder where they went. If you look closely, you'll see here's the Stone Bridge. Okay, so while the stone bridge was being repaired and repaired and repaired, they used ferries to go across the Tiverton. So even there wasn't even the stone bridge. This is in the 1900-1910 uh, the period. Okay. Some of the Newport ferries, we have the Governor Carr, we have uh, the Newport, there were about four different Newports. Uh, we have the Hamilton and I can't read that one. Anyway, those were Newport ferries, early Newport ferries that, that traversed over across to Jamestown. And then often the Saunders and the uh, <coughs> West Side were used to go from Jamestown to Saunderstown. Here you have the Wave, which was a small ferry that was used to transport everybody out to the uh, torpedo station. Okay? There actually was no causeway back in those days. Once the torpedo station left and they started building hotels out there, they, they put the causeway in. And that's about 19, I don't know, 68, 70, around there sometime. Here's another picture of the west side. Again, a small ferry and the Mohican. They were local ferries, on, uh, mostly on Narragansett Bay. So Bristol Ferry became the, a more important part of what was going on in, in Portsmouth. It was the commercial center. It was where every form of transportation came together. Eventually, by the, by the turn of the century, that is into the 20th century, we had steamboats, ferries, railroad, and trolleys all coming together at Bristol Ferry. It was really a, a hub of commercial activity. All the farmers brought their goods there and put them on steamboats and so on and sent them off to Providence or, or other places. So they, they stopped there. The steamboats. And there also were steamboats, by the way, that went to Saconnet Point, from Providence to, to Bristol Ferry to Saconnet Point, with a couple other stops along the way. They were mainly commercial. They were for bringing fish back from Saconnet Point. They still do that today, by the way, but they use trucks now. Uh, and they, so the, uh, the ferries, uh, the, uh, I'll, I'll have more about say about the Saconnet line in a minute. The old colony and Newport Railroad came on the island between 1862 and 1864. That's when they built the railroad bridge, what's left of it over here. Uh, and I'll, talk, I'll show you pictures of that. 
the Old Colony and Newport Railroad. And when they brought the Old Colony and Newport Railroad here, it had been the Old Colony and Fall River Railroad. And the people in Fall River were very incensed because they were changing the name of the railroad to Old Colony and Newport. The uh, Newport and Providence Street Railway Company <coughs> ran from uh, the Fifth Ward in Newport out, uh, let me think now, up spring, and out spring to Broadway to One Mile Corner at first, it stopped there for a while, and then on out to Two Mile Corner and went on straight out the West Main Road to Bristol Ferry. Okay, and that, that was the line that you could take a trolley from Newport to Bristol Ferry and then take the ferry across uh, to Bristol. And then you could take the, uh, they had a, um, the Providence, and War Providence, Warren, and Bristol rail line, a steam line that ran from Bristol, Warren, and Providence on the uh, route of the, um, the uh, bike path that's there today. <coughs> okay, so the ferries were owned by the uh, trolley company. And the owner of the trolley company was William H. Vanderbilt, very prominent man locally. He lived at a summer house at Oakland Farm in Portsmouth, and uh, it was the center of a great deal of activity. He was the son, I'm sorry, the, grand, the son of Alfred Gwynne Vanderbilt, uh, and who died on the uh, Lusitania in 1914. <coughs> the Bristol Ferry Wharf. Again, this is late in its career. It's pretty beat up. But you had the ferry landing up here. You had the trolley tracks that ran here. You could take the trolley right out to the end of the wharf, walk about 30 feet, and get on a boat, a ferry boat, to go across. Again, that Newport and Providence Street Railway Company was in, in business from 1898 to 1925. In 1925, all trolleys uh, ceased operation on the island, re being replaced by buses, by taxis, by, uh, by you know, cars. You know, quite a revolution. And anyway, the trolleys were replaced by the Colonial Bus Line, uh, and the buses would pick up passengers anywhere in Newport, you know, a lot of different stops. So they weren't strictly listed to the, stuck to the tracks like the trolleys were. <coughs> this is a painting of the, one of the buses, one of the colonial coaches coming off the Bristol. Okay. Um, that's really a nice picture. It's a painting. Okay. The Bristol Ferry Steamboat Wharf. What we call Bristol Ferry today was mainly a steamboat wharf. The big steamboats tied up there. Um, and Again, they, they stopped there quite often on their route from Providence to Fall River, Providence to Sakana Point, and Providence out into the bay sometimes. So Bristol Ferry was a real hub of a great deal of activity. The first steamboat in Narragansett Bay was in 1817. Uh, much more recognizable was the Fall River Line, uh, which started in the 1840s and lasted until 1937. They didn't stop at Bristol Ferry. They went from Fall River to Newport to New York. Okay, so ferries, um, they, they built this new wharf further south for the ferries uh, around 1903. Someone once loaned me a, a, a glass plate negative, three and a half by five, okay, small glass plate. I blew it up to a 16 by 20 and I have it hanging in my study at home and this is that picture. I've tried to do some research on it. It's the Richard A. Borden, the steamboat, and it's my guess because of the attire and so on is probably something like 1895, and that's at the Bristol Ferry Wharf. The glass plate is so sharp that that 16 by 20 I have, it blurs a little bit here because it's so big. You can actually see the, uh, the hats on the women on the deck there. And Richard A. Borden was in, in service around here between about 1885 and on into the early 20th century. The ferry terminal building, there was a house there at first. Then it was made, it converted into various things, including a restaurant run by the Pierce family, where you could get a lobster dinner for $2. That's a pretty good deal. Uh, and you can see the a la carte breakfast for 75 cents. And then later on, we had the, the ferry. This is obviously after the bridge was opened in 1929, uh, but it's, it shows the uh, ferry landing and the house there. The next picture shows what a lot of us remember, the Mount Hope Marina restaurant that was there uh, under the bridge until uh, 
Uh, Charlie Crouch sold it, and some people made nefarious activities there. And it, it was a drug landing place, and it burned down. And now that wharf is, is empty. Uh, it's, there's a committee that's working on restoration of it and turning it into a park, which is a really neat idea to say, because the view from down there is just spectacular. Ferries on the river. A lot of rivers, a lot of ferries across the river. Uh, again, Portsmouth to Tiverton, and not only just up here at the narrow part, further down as well. Um, the, one of the first ones was Durfee's Ferry, which crossed from Common Fence Point over to Humphreys Wharf, which is on the south side of the railroad bridge, or where the, where the railroad bridge used to be. Okay? Um, and that was also called the Picasso Ferry, and that goes back to about 1640, 1650. There was a ferry across there. We also had uh, various others that were developed along that way. We had a ferry known as the Anthony Ferry, which was further south. Howland's Ferry was at the location of the Stone Bridge before the Stone Bridge was built. And the Howland Ferry goes quite way back quite a, well too, quite a way too. So the <coughs> people who ran the ferries also were sometimes licensed to, to, <laughs> to sell strong drink. And so sort of pubs grew up around the ferry landings. And of course, that was a bonus to the ferryman uh, to make some extra money. There was a ferry across uh, from Glen, the Glen Farm, right at the foot, right by the Glen Farm itself, and across. There was a ferry landing in Tiverton at Almy's Wharf, uh, which was very important for the, the steamboats that went through there. It was also very important during Prohibition, a place to land all the booze that was coming in. That's another lecture. Uh, Anyway, there, so there were, and Taggers Ferry, which was from the end of uh, Indian Avenue across to Taylor Lane in, uh, in Little Compton. Again, there was a, during Prohibition, 1919 to 1933, the Coast Guard referred to the opening of the Sakana, entrance to the Sakana River as Times Square, because <laughs> there's so much activity there. Okay, so other ferries along the river and so on, and uh, again, some were licensed, some were not. Uh, they just, during the Revolutionary War, when the Americans came on the island to try to drive the British off and did not succeed, uh, they were forced back and they had to cross at the location of Howland's Ferry, Stonebridge, uh, to get back to Tiverton to escape. That was really an important uh, part of the Battle of Rhode Island in 1778. So, 1792, plans were made to build a bridge. Okay. Oh. That's, these are the Newport ferries. Okay, some, you remember those, some of them. I remember them, anyway. Okay, the bridge is on and off the island. <clears throat> In 1793, a petition was given to the state, uh, the, yeah, the state general assembly, for a charter to build a bridge, build, being built privately by what was known as the Rhode Island Bridge Company, and that was established to build the bridge. They tried to build the bridge. The first bridge they tried to build, they made out of wood. Now, most of you maybe have been on a boat, a sailboat or a motorboat, and gone through the opening between the, the stone bridge piers. You almost can't do it coming north when the tri tide's going out. It's a wicked rip through there. And that was the problem. It washed away. The first bridge that was built lasted three years. Uh, three months, sorry, three months. So they opened it in 1795, three months it was destroyed. They built another one the next year, also out of wood. It was infested by worms and the tide and lasted less than a year. The ferry oper operators were very happy about that because they didn't have to worry about the, uh, about the bridges being built. Eventually, in 1810, they built one that had a stone base to it. They, figured, they finally figured it out after 20 years that they needed something more substantial. And so the July 1810, new bridge opened. However, five years later, we had the so-called Great September Gale of 18, 18, uh, 1815. And that was absolutely a hurricane. They didn't use the term back in those days. But it destroyed the bridge again. Again, it must have been a contractor's dream to keep building more bridges. And remember, this is the only bridge across the island, off the island. Okay. So it opened again in 1817. 
and it was destroyed by the Great Gale of 1869, another hurricane. Okay. So again, they, they opened one in 1871 that had a wooden draw in the middle. That lasted until 1898. And in 1898, the Newport and Providence Street Railway Company, this is, I'm sorry, the Newport and Fall River Street Railway Company, that's the one that went out the East Main Road from, uh, from Newport, out the East Main Road, and then down Park Avenue and you know, across the, the bridge to Tiverton. So uh, they, they had a stone bridge at this point. It had to be strengthened in the center because the trolleys were going to go across it. And I think the weight probably was OK. They were testing it here. And there's about as much human weight on this as there was trolley. You can see the rather portly people that are standing by watching. Anyway, this is an open car trolley that was coming across. And again, you could take this trolley line from Newport over to Tiverton. You would have to change in Tiverton, then you could go to Fall River on a trolley. And if you really were ambitious, you could go to Nashua, New Hampshire. Four and a half hours on a trolley, an open car. No, thank you. So they put the, the weight test on. It worked. And the trolley was obviously the heaviest thing. You can imagine how in, in 19, what, 1898, what cars there were. You can imagine the weight of them with nothing. But the trolleys were pretty heavy. And some of the trolleys carried freight as well, so that made them even heavier. So the stone bridge then, uh, more strengthening was necessary. They opened another one in 1907. This is a real saga. Uh, but it too didn't work very well, so they finally repaired it again. And this is the one they built in 1912, which was the last one that they built. This was the one that lasted until 1956. Okay. And you can see how the draw opens. You've got Gould Island in the distance there. Okay. And there was a man who sat up here and had to open that bridge for every boat that went through it. Sailboats, small boats. There weren't very many large ships that went through there. There was a, a fuel storage depot over in Tiverton that brought in some big ships. But most of you know the Sakana River is pretty shallow in spots. It has a, it has a area to get through, but for the most part, it's pretty shallow. Now, this picture, and it's not a very good picture because I blew it up from a really tiny one, but what it shows you is the vulnerability of the stone bridge. I mean, there it is, out in the middle of <laughs> everything, OK? And you can imagine any storm surge that came up the Sakonet River uh, put it in, in serious jeopardy, OK? But that shows the vulnerability of it. It's really out there in the middle of the, the river. You also see there's no escape bridge also in this picture. And uh, you know a lot of activity. The, most of the activity that you see right here on that side, which is where there are um, marinas now, was uh, the Church Brothers Fisheries. The Church Brothers had a big, they were from Tiverton, there were seven of them. And they had a big fishing business in which they would go out in the ocean, open the bridge again, and come back, open it again. Uh, and they fished mostly for Menhaden. And there also was a company there called the Narragansett Oil and Guano Works that harvested fish oil and guano, which is seagull yeah. stuff. Okay? Uh, and they made fertilizer out of it. Okay. But that was a fairly big operation. The Church Brothers were there. Oh, from about the 1880s or so into the 1920s and 30s. And a lot of those houses, those big houses you see over in Tiverton, as you go along the shore, the big houses you see out there were Church Brothers houses. Each of them had a mansion out there. Okay. This is a more modern view, 1999. I took that picture. But again, it shows you the, the vulnerability of the location. No wonder they had about seven bridges there. I mean, it was just was out in the middle of nowhere. And Tiverton now is working on a grant and getting some money to fix up their side over here for a fishing pier. Maybe Portsmouth will do the same, inspired by that. Okay. Uh, but here again, you see it much more, this is much more settled as it is now with the islands out there. That's spectacle, I think. And uh, you have all the other islands there. The whole area of, of Island Park, almost the whole area of Island Park, uh, was developed mainly in the period of, of the 1898-1920 period. Okay. 
when the trolley line ran along Park Avenue, the trolley companies created what were called trolley parks. And trolley parks were amusement parks. Okay? I grew up in western Pennsylvania, I have to admit. I've only been here for 55 years. <laughs> but uh, we had one there, and they had one here. And the purpose of putting an island park was because you could get people to come from Newport, Middletown, Portsmouth, Fall River, Tiverton, and so on. It was a good central location. They sold a lot of trolley tickets. Of course, the trolley fair was a nickel a town in, at the turn of the century. So I don't know how much money they made. Uh, they peaked, though. The trolleys peaked in about 1913 and went out of business in 1925, all of them. Okay. But anyway, that shows you. And, and uh, I perhaps should say that one other thing, locally, for those of you that live here, Common Fence Point was just that. It was a commonly fenced point. During the first days of the settlement of Portsmouth, when they were building houses down in the vicinity of the Roger Williams Conference Center and uh, the, the gravel works across the street there, that's where the first houses were. But what they did was to build a fence across Common Fence Point and put all the sheep out there mainly sheep, but they had cows, I, I would imagine, too, out, out there, out here. Okay? And they all had earmarks. There's a, the town records actually have, the second volume of the town records has been published, and it has all the earmarks for the different people that they use on the sheep, so they could identify their own sheep. Anyway, so that's what Common Fence Point was. It was a commonly fenced point for all the sh sheep to be. Eventually, they had two acre house lots, again, in the vicinity of the Roger Williams Conference Center there, and then they got two and three hundred acre farms further south that went all the way to Melville and all the way to, uh, to Sandy Point, okay, the early settlers. And those distributions continued until about 1712, 1713. They came in 1638. But until about 1712, uh, 1715, uh, they had pretty much used up all the land. We, Portsmouth was not exactly a thriving, well-populated town at that time. Some of you might not realize that in 1945, the population of Portsmouth was about 4,300. Okay. 17,000 now, 17,800, I think it is. Uh, but anyway, it was really small until the end of World War II. All of a sudden, houses exploded all around. The Sakonet River Bridge was under construction from 1954 to 1956. Actually, it started a little bit before that. And it was built, these are pictures of it being constructed. Um, I have about 25 of these pictures of, you're not going to see them all, but pictures of it being under construction. Okay? And you can see the railroad bridge underneath here, okay, which was there. The railroad bridge, this railroad bridge was built around 1900. <clears throat> it was the second railroad bridge. I'll show you pictures of that in a minute. Okay, how about the railroad bridge right now? The old colony, Newport Railroad, crossed the Sakonet River in, during what was being built, again, extended from Fall River to Newport and extended along the shore. If you, there's, there's still the route there. The Tiverton Railroad Station was just across the Sakonet River Bridge, across the railroad bridge, and that followed the coast, the shore, all the way up to Fall River. And then it came across, and as we all know, it goes down the west side of the island. Okay, still there. Of course, it isn't there now because the bridge doesn't work. We don't have a bridge. So the Church Brothers and uh, Narragansett Oil Guano Works, I talked about that. They were in Common Fence Point. The first railroad bridge had a stone base to it. It had a, an opening. It had a, a pivot that it had there that would uh, allow the ships to get through. Again, you can see this ship here, sailboat, is waiting to get through. That's probably one of the, the uh, pogey boats, actually. And then the second railroad bridge, this one was built in 1860, between 1862 and 64. This one was built in 1900. <clears throat> and this one, too, had a center that swung around. Okay? It would open that way. And eventually, it was really weird, eventually, that was controlled from, I think it was New Bedford. When they, when they got the word that somebody was coming through, they pushed buttons and so on. They would probably do it from a drone today. But, uh, but anyway, it would, they would open it. And a barge ran into it. I think I have the date on the next slide. I think it was 1988. Yep. A barge bumped into it and threw it off kilter. Okay. 
But if you want to see the turntable, what it rotated on, come to the Museum of the Portsmouth Historical Society. We have it there. Yeah. Okay. And you'll see it's a really, it's not big, it's only about this big, but that's what the whole bridge swung on. Anyway, I took this picture out there in, in 1995, and as we all know, the, the middle part of that bridge is all gone now. So, okay. The Mount Hope Bridge, again, uh, completed in 1929. Um, the construction began in 27. It was built by private, a private company. It wasn't built by the state. The private company, one of whom investors was William H. Vanderbilt, put his ferry out of business, but uh, he was one of the people who built it. They built it private subscription. It was only about two or three years after it was built that uh, it was uh, sold to the state. Again, open with great ceremony on October 25th, 1929, four days before the stock market crash. And that's a picture of, of Bristol Ferry Wharf with the bridge being built behind. Now, when they built this bridge, they decided on a new technique. Modern technology takes over. So what they did was that they, they had a new process for winding the cables, what you see here hanging up in the, in the sky. And so they tried a new process for that. Then they started hanging the deck plates to it. And then it started to fray. And then they had to take down all the deck plates on the barges, rewire it, and start over. Okay. A few delays there for that. These are some construction scenes of the, uh, the uh, Mount Hope Bridge. They actually, you can't see it very well in this picture, but this, has, this is a restaurant that was down there somewhere they built, for the, I guess, for the workers. I have the statistics, on, I think, on the next slide that, on that. Oh, first this. We had a local newspaper. It's called the Newport County Sentinel. And it was edited by uh, Mrs. Boone, okay, who lived over by the Mount Hope Bridge. And this was her newspaper celebrating the opening of the Mount Hope Bridge. And it was quite a, a spectacular ceremony. They had people dressed up like Indians, like colonists, and, and a big parade across the bridge and everything, and back and forth between Bristol and Portsmouth. It was quite a big deal. Okay. I have the dedication program at home. I didn't bring it, but uh, there's stuff around. And there was a, a first day cover of, uh, you know, what they had us in stamp collecting, and it memorialized the opening of the bridge. These are the two young women who cut the ribbon. Rita Barbara Cullen was from Bristol, and Nancy Weaver Thompson was from Newport. Okay. And that's the actual cutting of the bridge. You can see everybody in the back is having a good time. Um, this was 1929. About 1979, 80, I met Nancy Weaver Thompson. I was, I was photographing weddings, and I, I photographed her granddaughter's wedding. And she said, her daughter said, not the granddaughter, but the daughter, she's famous, you know. I said, for what? I said, she cut the ribbon on opening the Mount Hope Bridge. <laughs> Obviously, she's gone now, but uh, very nice lady. Interesting. But real huge ceremony for this. Some statistics. It was 6,130 6, feet. The main span is 1,200 feet. Longest girder is 15 feet. That might be a misprint. It's probably longer than that. The towers are 285 feet above the water. The deepest foundation, 54 feet below the water. The first tolls were 60 cents for cars and 10 cents for pedestrians or people on buses. You had to pay a toll if you're riding a bus across. Now, those numbers went, went way up later. And then they went down. And then they went to nothing. But I, certainly we all, I think, can remember paying 10 cents uh, to go across. Anyway, this is, this is 6,100 feet. The Newport Bridge is, I think it's 11,000 something by comparison. Okay. So that's the view from Bristol uh, looking across. Is it? Yeah. Bridge. Now, the Newport Bridges, until 1940, when the Jamestown Bridge was built, 
the first Jamestown Bridge, okay? The main route, you would take a ferry from Newport to Jamestown, drive across Jamestown, a lot of us remember doing that later, and then another ferry from the other side of Jamestown over to Saunderstown, which went just about where the bridge ended up going. It's very same area there. Um, so the Jamestown Bridge was completed in 1940. That is the bridge that went from Saunderstown to Jamestown. Okay? And it opened with great ceremony in July of 1940. And the cost, which some people felt was really excessive, was $3 million. Okay. That's a postcard of it in 1940. And this is another postcard that says, our beautiful new bridge will soon be open. Don't forget our three-day celebration, August 2, 3, 4, official dedication on the 3rd. Be sure and come. Okay. So everybody rallied around that. This is the Jamestown Bridge in 1979. I took this photograph from an airplane uh, back then. And we had then got the Verrazano Bridge, which opened in 1992. And then, of course, we all recall it was quite a dramatic scene when they blew up the old Jamestown Bridge. The Newport Claiborne Pell Bridge is the longest suspension bridge in New England. It opened in June of 1969, 11,248 feet, and it carries in excess of 27,000 cars a day. Maybe a few less right now because <laughs> few people are finding another way to get across. Anyway, what's interesting about this picture is that I don't think it's actually where it ended up being. This is the artist's conception. I think it's further south than it actually, it's further north than it actually came to be. Okay, interesting. That's the artist's conception, however, and a lot of us lived through that uh, and watched it being built for year after year. So, in conclusion, as I said at the beginning, geographically we live on an island and we sometimes forget that. You know, we take it for granted that we have a easy access off. Uh, and maybe we are too closely tied to the mainland, some people feel. I mean, imagine coming all the way out here from Newport sometime. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Let alone from South Portsmouth, which is where I live. Okay. Uh, we do have an island mentality around here, which has persisted for about 379 years. That, you know, if we have to go to Providence, uh, oh, God, all the way to Providence. <laughs> which takes you 25 minutes, usually. Less than that from here. Uh, but we do have a, a really incredible history in, on, on this island. There's so much history here. I've written six books on local history, and, and I have, I've scratched the surface. There's so much history in, in this area, on this island. Uh, when we had the 375th anniversary of Portsmouth three years ago, four years ago, I did 10 lectures. And in the next year, which was Newport's 375th, I did seven more. Uh, and I teach, some of my students are here, I teach Newport County History at Salve in their adult education program, the Circle of Scholars. And so I, I'm kind of immersed in all of this uh, more than I uh, ever thought I would be, not being a native after all. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so we are really lucky to have our island. I mean, it, the history itself is, is really pretty unique. And the whole Newport County history is unique. You've seen a few pictures here from my collection of stuff. Uh, if you could have seen my office about a week and a half ago, I had, I had about 14 albums laying on the floor trying to find the pictures that I wanted to use. I have over 1,000 old pictures of Portsmouth, uh, pictures and postcards. I have uh, about 3,000 of Newport. There were much more, and they're all before World War I for the most part. Okay. I don't collect recent stuff. I have 600 postcards of Little Compton. Can you imagine? A lot of them are houses. But I did research on a particular photographer. His name was O.E. Du Bois from Fall River. And there still are some Du Bois living here somewhere on this end. Um, and he did a lot of photography in, on, in the county from about 1906 until 1916. And he was a wonderful photographer. You've seen a couple of his pictures in this show. 
And I did a book on him in 1983 because I had 60 of his postcards from the Sakonet area. Okay. I now have 640. He was very prolific, okay? which is wonderful. We are so lucky to have them. They're all real photo uh, sepia tone pictures. They're really great. Anyway, that pretty much is what I wanted to talk about. I'll be happy to take questions. Oh, I have, before I take questions, I need to see Conley. Come over here, Conley. And I need some lights. Come on over, come on, come on. In my travels, one of the things I found was a brochure. A brochure that talks about the summer plan for your pleasure area called I Common Fence Point. <laughs> it has pictures of fun people swimming. It has a lot of stuff. Common Fence Point Beach, plan for your pleasure. A wonderful modern seashore community with many unusual features to add to your comfort. Tennis, swimming, sandboxes, whatever. <laughs> it also has, this was published, published in 1924, and it also has a plat map. Oh. 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 But, oh. but, you can't have this. <laughs> Such a tease, my goodness. But, I copied it. And so, what we have here. How about that, you guys? Thank you, thank you. I'll just show you what it looks like. What we have is each piece, and of course, on a brochure like this, some of them end up upside down, so that's why I had to do it in pieces. Anyway, here's the plat map with the date of 1924 on it. And it was developed by, uh, what's his name? Brown. Henry A. Brown Corporation, West Main Street, Brockton. Oh, okay, so that's wow. that. Yeah. Here is the beach plan for your pleasure. Okay, and I had these drawn out too, so you can you can frame them easier. It has. Let's see, two of the nearly 80 cottages already built in this summer land plan for your pleasure. Your guide to happiness. <laughs> we'll, we'll set this up here. You can look at it after we're done. Yeah. And it has a wonderful modern seashore community with many unusual features to add to your comfort, including a picture of the community house, where community dances, socials, and entertainments are held. From this piazza, one looks across the recreation field directly onto Narragansett Bay. Oh. Thank you so much. That is amazing. I have them dry now. They can be framed fairly easily. We will easily. do that. Yeah, they will hang proudly in here. Thank you. They're Thank odd, you. odd sizes. Wow. Okay. Oh, you want this to keep it in? Tommy, want to keep it in this? I don't know. Well, leave it out so people can see it. Yeah, I'll put them up right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, again, uh, this was developed as a summer resort. 1924 by people from Brockton. Kind of interesting. And there were, maybe there still are, people from Taunton and Brockton that live here, uh, summer here. Okay. And, but it's, it's really interesting to see how that, that brochure came about. I, I just, I don't know, eBay or something. I forget where I saw it. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm always looking for more stuff. I don't know why. I have 62 albums of old pictures. So God, crazy. Anyway, I'll be happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Any questions? Yes? During World War II, what role did Confidence Point play in terms of submarine watch and so on? Because it was alleged that their military had taken over some of the, the uh, uh, land out on Confidence Point for them. I've never seen any, any maps of that. I mean, the military was very heavily involved in uh, Sakana Point. Right. You had a lot of forts, a fort down, a major fort. I don't, I don't, I've never seen anything here. That there was stuff as far as Melville. They had patrols at Melville. I know that. Yes. Uh, I don't know. I can't answer. I'm sorry. Yes? Well, you, drive, you drive down Anthony Road, on either side at intervals there are large brick or rock or squares that rise up. Do you have any idea what those were? They almost looked like they were state boundaries. 
delineates the width of the road. Yeah, I think the town, the town probably did that to establish the, uh, the road. I mean, one of the things that happened at Bristol Ferry, I don't know if you, I'm sure some of you have been to the common at Bristol Ferry, there were rocks on the corners, okay? And there was grass growing on people's yards that went beyond the rocks. And Doug Smith and a few other people a few years ago just pushed it all back, got the town to more directly establish the common. And a lot of people lost a lot of their land, I and mean, that's the kind of thing that could happen. But that's probably what it was. I, I would guess that's what it was. So, yeah, if I could, those boundaries that you see up by the VFW Hall, that's the actual road right away width. It's much wider up there than it is as you go down. It steps down a couple of times as you come through the neighborhood. And I think you'll probably see that if you look at that plot plan. I believe it's 100 feet wide out by the VFW. Wow, that's really wide, yeah. Hmm. He envisioned this as a business district all the way down from oh, really? the VFW. Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. Any other questions anybody has? I'm going to be here for a little while after, so if you have any questions or look at the maps and so on and see. Yes? Um, I'm just wondering some of the houses that were built in 1924. Do you know, do some of those still currently exist? Oh, I'm sure they do. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. And, and some of them have been added on to and raised up and a few other things, yeah. They're pretty small lots. You look at that flat map. It's, I think mostly a quarter acre, if I'm not. 50 by 80. 50 by 80. What's that? 4,000 4, square feet. That's quarter of an acre. Yeah. 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 How many houses did you say it was 80 houses? Did I get it wrong? No, I didn't, I didn't oh, say. Oh, I don't know. Exactly. Uh, but again, it was a summer resort. That's really the way it was set up. And, and most of Island Park came to be that way. Yes? I bought a house in the past year on uh, the corner of King Philip and Massasoit. Supposedly built in 1923 in Narragansett Heights. Hmm. I tried to find more information on it. I got back to 1926, but I have no information as to the building of the house or who built it. Hmm. My understanding, How based on on map research, is that there was almost nothing here, you know, before the Henry Brown started, you know, developing all this. Uh, was it a marsh? I don't, no, part of it, over that side. The yeah. houses that were present are on that. Yeah. Uh, but there wasn't much here at all. And I mean, Island Park developed, and the other part of Island Park over there, because of the trolley park. And people started building houses out over the seawall and a few other things there, uh, which didn't quite survive the 38 hurricane very well. I was told that the house was the first house built in 1923 hmm. in Narragansett Heights on a high land, uh -huh. I have no idea if that's That could be. I, I, I don't know what kind of records there would be for that, except maybe with this Henry Brown company, okay. um, which again was in Brockton. Okay. Um, but uh, the town records, I, I would say I've done a lot of research on houses in the town records, and I have a lot of maps that go back to 1830. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, there wasn't much out here. I have a photograph from, from 19, eight from up at, on, on Butts Hill Fort and looking over this way there's not much there. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. Question about the, the name. I, I've, I've seen an old map that said common sense point and I've seen an even older map that said conference point. I wanted to know if you had any thoughts. Or I think that's a misprint. I really, there are a lot of mistakes on the old maps too. Now I, don't, I, don't, I can't imagine what that would, why that would be. Viable. It's just somebody. That looks like an F sometimes. Yeah. That's true. An F does look like an S sometimes. Or an S looks like an F. Actually. Any other questions? Again, if you have individual questions, I'll try to answer them. Thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it.